Okay, I think we're good to go. So, welcome everybody. Om Gyanat Nirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurude Namaha Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chaiva Narat Narotamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tato Jayam Udirayat Panchakalpa Taru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Vaevacha Patita nam bhavane bio, Vaishnave bio, namo namaha. <clears throat> okay, hello everyone. So we're discussing um, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 2. And we've just been doing a, an overview of the text, and now we have pretty much come to the end of the chapter. There's um, a series of four verses left here. Um, text 30 through 34 and then we get to the end of the end of the chapter so i'm going to go through those um four verses today there's actually five thursdays in in uh april so i i kind of divided that i i didn't divide the the chapter quite properly although i i divided it according to kind of its natural sections but so i'll probably have one more class to give uh next thursday and i'll just um uh, I'll just uh, kind of go into the third chapter because the, there's actually these, these verses that we're going to speak about today are kind of like a bridge between the two. So next class, I'll do just a short review of the whole chapter and probably go into chapter three. Um, so after, to bring us up to date, after speaking extensively um, about the nature of bhakti and its characteristics, what it is not, um, its development, its flowering from Shraddha to Prem, um, the text moved um, into describing the object of bhakti. So it, divine service was described and, and uh, the purification of the, of the practitioner was described. And in the last class, I think we started more kind of on the description of divinity. Um, the object of bhakti, Krishna or Vasudeva was the name that was repeated over and over again. So this is also the, the Advaigyan Tattva that was um, described earlier on, uh, known variously as Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Bhagavan being the object of bhakti for, uh, the object of worship for bhakti. Uh, there's a differentiation made between Shiva and Vishnu and the demigods, uh, the different demigods who rules of, ruled over the uh, modes of nature, and it emphasized the transcendental position of Vasudev, um, because Initially, in, in the beginning of the chapter, bhakti was described as, as causeless and transcendental. So the object uh, of, its, of its focus would also be um, transcendental. The name that comes up several times, twice at least, is it hoksaja, which, which is, means beyond, you know, overtly transcendental. Uh, Prabhupada uses, the, or in the word, there's the word mukti pada too, the one who can offer mukti, meaning that you know, in order to be able to offer mukti, one is beyond the modes. Um, and so the, the, the nature of this, this object is shuddha sattva, so transcendental. In the last two verses, there were a description of him as kind of the be all and end all of all knowledge, all action, all penance, all paths described in the Vedas, Vasudeva, Paraveda, Vasudeva, Paragyana. And um, that brings us to these last four verses of the chapter. And they're, like I said, kind of a bridge um, they're like a bridge that, that kind of lead into the, the next chapter, the third chapter, where more descriptions of the object of bhakti um, are given, the avatars, and also the answer to the, would it be the one, to, the fourth question of the sages to tell about the, um, to tell about Krishna's avatars. So uh, let's see, yeah, the, the next chapter, these, these verses here are really about the Purusha avatars or um, the, the, uh, the Leela of creation. So in a sense, um, Krishna has these Leelas of creations and then these Leelas that are kind of pure pastimes that take place within the creation. Um, and this is, like I said, kind of answers the fourth question of the sages. So from the description of the Guna avatars, um, which were very closely related to the world. 
um, we go to the source of the world and the form of God that presides over the creation and the material creation. Um, and so we're gonna hear this kind of this story, uh, the Hindu kind of myth or the Hindu story of, of creation. And you'll see it's very different from um, what we learned or what I learned growing up, <laughs> going to church. Um, the, the like for example, the time scales are just ginormous compared to, to a Christian idea. Um, there's a, the idea of circular time and, and many of these kind of linear stories are going on within a larger circle. Um, there's, there's Svarga and Visarga, which is um, uh, the primary creation and the secondary creation. But in fact, in, in, in uh, these ideas here in Hinduism, in a sense, there is, there is no creation actually, no creation ex nihilo, like in Christianity where something is created um, out of nothing. So, uh, it, so it's very, it's, it's very different. And we're going to hear about, um, sorry, Sean needs his shorts. <laughs> they're, they're stuck in the chair. He was milling around here, distracting me. So um, anyhow, these verses here are um, about, about Vishnu. So um, and Vishnu is one of the most prominent aspects of God. In some sense, in Hinduism, Vishnu is 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 you know he's one of the most popular gods. Um, it's because Vishnu is from whom the word world um, issues forth. He's the maintainer, and he's ultimately the one in which it rests at at the end. Over and over again, this is going on. So he's very popular and prominent um, because he's very close to us. He's in he's involved in in in. Uh, you know, the world in which we live. He's the creator of the world in which we live. He's the maintainer of the world in which we live. So he's very prominent in people's, um, people's minds. So we come to the verses here, um, verse 30, we'll start. Um, and these, these, like I said, are the, the, the great creation myth of Hinduism. Uh, That's the story of where we came from as conscious beings. Um, it's the story of where the world came from. It's the story of where the world goes to rest. And this, this Shristi Lila, that as it's called, this description of Maha Vishnu, Garbha Dakshai Vishnu, Kshira Dakshai Vishnu entering the world, this is found throughout the scripture. Um, uh, it's alluded to in the Gita. We find, it, of course, here in the Bhagavatam. We find it in the Brahma Samhita and plenty of other um, uh, Vedic texts. So it's, it's, it's quite consistent. Um, perhaps I should read the verse. So text 30. Sa evadam sasar jagre bhagavan atma maya sad asad rupaya chaso guna maya guno vibhu. In the beginning of the material creation, the absolute Lord in his transcendental position created the energies of cause and effect by his own internal energy. So, um, you know, from the modern perspective, these stories might seem um, quite fantastical, especially when you start getting into, uh, you know, Vishnu lying down in the milk ocean or, or, or um, you know, unlimited egg-like universes coming out of the pores of his body. It might seem very kind of uh, fantastical. And, you know, I, I think I, I mentioned to it like as the, um, the creation myth and, the door's about to slam, <clears throat> sorry, uh, the creation myth. But myth is not, you know, it's only kind of in the modern world that this world myth has basically become, become synonymous with, with something that's untrue. If something's a myth, we basically think it's something that's untrue. And that's not really what I meant by the word myth. Um, in the past, myths were, um, they, were, they weren't meant to be like historical, accurate descriptions of events that, you know, occurred within time but more of descriptions of things that were going on, on outside of time. Um, and this, this here in the beginning of material creation, the absolute Lord in his transcendental position created the energies of cause and effect by his own internal. So this is going on, he is outside of time. Um, um, and and the script, the, you know, this is going on, be, uh, he, he's about to create time, but at the moment he's, you know, he's outside of time. And the idea of myths being historical events, or, that's kind of not the idea. The scriptures speak about these things kind of from a poetic perspective. And that doesn't mean that it's not true, but um, it is true, but it's a subject, it's the subjective perspective. 
And it's certainly not less real than the objective perspective. Um, it's a subjective realization of the sages, um, uh, you know, from the point of view of, of their uh, realization, from the point of view of their consciousness. And sometimes uh, modern ideas uh, line up with these kind of things. Um, and it's kind of exciting when they do, when you find confirmation of the, the realization of the sages in the, in the confirmation of the scientists, like perhaps things like um, I'm not very familiar with many of them, but things like um, string theory or the idea of the, the contracting and uh, expanding and contracting universes, um, the idea of the multiverse, for example, uh, which is, you know, you can very much kind of see in the story of Mahavishnu. But, uh, you know, these things might, you know, they might not always line up um, precisely, and it can be a bit problematic to exp uh, expect to find you know, uh, objective evidence in the scripture and the Bhagavatam that's exactly the same um, as modern science. You know, if, if your faith becomes, um, if your faith becomes dependent on, on finding, you, you know, seeing the, ob finding objective evidence for the, the stories and leelas and myths in the scripture, it can, it can become a problem when it doesn't. When it does, it's 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 quite nice to see that you know uh, th these quantum theories and stuff are, are very much uh, expressed in the Vedic literature, maybe perhaps in more poetic language. But you can really see the correspondence. It's, it's a very nice, it's very nice and very confirming. But I think one should just be, be careful not to to put too much stock in finding all of that lining up, because uh, in a sense, the scriptures. Um, are not meant to be read in the same way that science is meant to be read or understood. They're coming from two different perspectives. One is from the subjective perspective and one is from the objective perspective. Um, and, and, you know, thinking about script, the scriptural point of view throughout history, um, there have been different ways of reading it. What comes to my mind, I, I'm not exactly sure how it lines up with the Eastern traditions, but um, you know, in 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 Western in Western thought, the the scriptures were not always meant to be to be taken absolutely literally. And in modern times, we we kind of see that this literal um, and one could could you know say fanatical approach um, might seem the most prevalent to, to understanding scripture. But in fact, it would be very foreign to to many of the thinkers um, from the past. Um, they, what I have read and, and understood a bit by, by, by reading different authors about this is that, um, you know, through in the West, in the past, that the scripture was looked at very much like an individual, like a, in a sense, like a person. Um, but they could be, the, the, the scripture was looked at as having um, a body, a mind and a soul, just as an individual, or we have a, the body, a mind and soul. And so initially there would be in, in like the body would be considered to be kind of like a literal interpretation of it. The mind would be, the mind of the scripture would be like the moral interpretation of it, what one could draw in terms of morality. And then finally there would be the soul or the spirit of the scripture. And that would be kind of the, the spiritual or realized um, understanding, vigyan of, of the scripture. So it'd be kind of like an ascent from a material or literal understanding through kind of morality and, and up to a, a spiritual realization of what the scripture was, was speaking about. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. It's, I'm not saying that there, there isn't a place for the, for a literal understanding of the scripture. There is. And in, in fact, I think, um, in many of these kind of uh, uh, scholarly traditions or monastic traditions, they would kind of insist on having that foundation, having the literal understanding of the text, understanding you know what it was saying literally before one could actually kind of like uh, penetrate and go deeper into to the the morality of it or into this into the spirituality of it. Um, so you know the the body and mind and soul and soul are all important. Um, but the idea is, is not that one has to kind of believe, believe literally in these types of things. The scriptures give these beautiful um, poetic descriptions um, of these events. But the thing is, they also give the means to, to realize them um, directly. 
So they, and they give the means to participate in them directly. Um, so, so there's that, and they, they are also meant to kind of give the living being um, in the world a kind of conceptual orientation or a moral orientation. Um, for example, you know, all these verses, when we go through kind of the positions of these three main Vishnus and the, the, the way the creation unfolds, um, there's, there's different lessons to be drawn from it. Like, you know, here in this first verse, when you start looking at Mahavishnu or Karna Dakshai Vishnu, something that can be drawn from it is, is that consciousness is primary, the, 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 the primary nature of consciousness, that it's consciousness that moves matter. We see here it's the absolute Lord in his transcendental position, consciousness personified that, that creates the energies of cause and effect. And that's, you know, on the large scale that's going on, but that's also how we, how we feel. We feel that we, we have a, a notion or a thought and then we act towards matter. So these types of things can also uh, be drawn out. So in the beginning of the material creation, again, the absolute Lord in his transcendental position created the energies of cause and effect by his own internal energy. So here we've introduced uh, the first Purusha avatar. So the first um, avatar for the Leela of creation. Um, and we're kind of going up the scale in a sense uh, from the Guna avatars to the Purusha avatars to the Leela avatars. Now here we're gonna talk about the Purusha avatars and it, we'll do a little dip because it'll go from Maha Vishnu to Garbha Dakshai Vishnu closer into the world to Kshira Dakshai Vishnu who is the closest in the sense that he's in all the atoms. Um, but so here we're speaking about Maha Vishnu. Of course, Vishnu means all pervading. Um, and we know that he's made of pure, pure consciousness, like I mentioned before, Shuddha Sattva. So Karana means um, effect, Karana. So he is the one who lies on the causal ocean um, and innumerable universes emanate from the pores of his body. I can very clearly picture the BBT image of that <laughs> it was striking when I first uh, I don't know, first saw the Bhagavatam or something. This uh, Mahavishnu lying down in the causal ocean uh, with you know unlimited um, bubbles, egg-like bubbles coming out of the pores of his body. So, in other words, he's huge. That's what it. He's ginormous, and that and that's what it also means that consciousness is ginormous. Consciousness is all accommodating. Um, we don't even have the ability to comprehend comprehend um, one universe uh, and its size and its 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 breadth. So let alone um, unlimited universes. Um, they, it's there's a verse in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that says they pass through unlimited universes are like the specks of dust that pass through, um, you know, the screens of a window. So. We have a lot of that here. If you ever come and visit, you'll see we have a lot of screen. The whole temple room and, and prashadam room is basically just screen. And uh, there's a lot of dust that passes through the windows. It's a constant endeavor to keep the screens clean. So the Chaitanya Charitamrita makes that, that comparison. The amount of universes are like the dust that, that uh, pass through the screen of the windows. And I, I'm not sure if you've ever seen those videos on YouTube. I, I certainly like watch, watching them where they basically are just showing like time, time scale or size scale more. They're showing like the size scale of the earth compared to the sun, compared to the solar system and up and up and up and up. And it all, it becomes unimaginable really like you're trying to comprehend these sizes. And that's, you know, there's no end to it really to, to how large the universe becomes. Um, and that's just one universe. And so innumerable universes are coming out of the pores of his body. How many pores are on, uh, you know, how many pores do you have on your body? A lot. I was laughing the other night because um, in my vanity, I was kind of examining my nose, looking at the pores on my nose and man, they look huge. <laughs> I was like, oh man, a universe could even come out of the pore of my nose. And I started, <laughs> my pores are so big. I started trying to count, you know, how many pores were on the, the end of my nose because they were quite visible. Um, and of course it was impossible, but if anybody has any good uh, poor, natural pore treatments, I'd love to hear it. But the basic point is that um, even in the material, material sphere, it's impossible to measure. So we know Gurmaj often refers to the word Maya in its capacity to mean to measure. So that can be drawn out from this um, 
you know this image of Mahavishnu and and his his size and the 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 unlimited numbers of universes. Uh, what else can be drawn out? That consciousness is infinitely larger than matter, infinitely more accommodating than matter. However, you want to talk about it, and also that we are extremely small. So, um, you know, I've always kind of found solace in that idea. Whenever uh, you know I'm under a lot of stress or um, you know, things are not going right or, or whatnot to, to really kind of take a step back and see really how small we are in, in relation to, to reality. I've always found comfort in this. I don't know, perhaps not everybody does, but so, yeah. So here in verse 30, um, and on, we start, we start seeing what, what was invoked in the very beginning of the text with with um, the reference to the Vedanta Sutra, Janma Yasya Yata. So this is this is what we're seeing. Prabhupada, you know, he says the way he translates it in his um in the uh, initial verse of the Bhagavatam is I meditate on him, the transcendental reality, who is the primal cause of all causes. So he has a position prior to the to the creation of cause and effect. Um, and that's stated here in this verse. Therefore, he's not tangled by it. Ishvara Paramakrishna Satchidananda Vigraha Nadi Radhya Govinda Sarvakarna Karanam. That's what the Sarvakarna Karanam means. He's the cause of all causes. He's the cause of the Purush avatars, uh, the first of, of which uh, you know we're speaking of here, Karna Dakshai Vishnu. So when we hear this Janma Yasya Yataha at the beginning of the Bhagavatam, um, which it comes from the Vedanta Sutra, from which everything emanates, from which everything is maintained, and into which everything returns. It's referring to Krishna, of course, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudeva, but it's it's really referring to him in his form as Vishnu, Vishnu, um, or uh, that we're hearing about here, or more precisely, Balaram <laughs> in his form of Vishnu, as we'll see. These Vishnus are all, are all, are, are all coming from Nityananda Balaram. So mentioning Balaram, of course, the, the beginning of the Chaitanya Charitamrita has very beautiful um, auspicious verses glorifying his position, um, describing the, the gradation and expansion of these Purusha avatars from uh, Sankarshan, Karna Dakshai Vishnu, Garbo Dakshai Vishnu, Kshiro Dakshai Vishnu, um, along with uh, Shesha Nag and it's it, the serpent bed. Um, of Lord Vishnu, and Vishnu is described. Uh, these are these Vishnu expansions that are described to, as as plenary portions and portions of plenary portions of Sri Nityananda Balaram. I didn't know what the word plenary meant for for quite a while, so I ended up um, looking it up, and it just means you know it means full, like in French plein. I don't know if you know that word plein. It means it means full, um, and the idea is kind of something like I. I mean I I'm not very familiar with how holograms work but it's something similar like you you have this hologram and it, it looks you know three-dimensional with all those depth and 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 whatnot but a hologram is actually made up each pixel of the hologram contains the entire picture so on a on a normal picture a normal screen or something like that the picture would be made up of individual little pixels of color but in a hologram from what i've understood is that each kind of pixel of a hologram has the entire uh, image of the hologram in it. So when we hear uh, plenary portions or portions of plenary portions, um, it's referring to this kind of idea. It's, it's a, a portion, but it's full, it's complete. It's got, it's, it's got the same thing. So Nityananda um, or his, his you know, non-different form is Balaram, the best friend of Krishna, the older brother of Krishna, or Mahaprabhu, for example, um, he's the, desire, the, 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 the deity that does, uh, presides over the Dham um, and existence in general. So he provide, presides over the spiritual world and the material world, what we're talking about here. He maintains the, um, the form of the Dham, the sacred geography of the Dham um, in the spiritual realm, but he also expands himself uh, to create and maintain um, the realms of time and space and gravity and you know all these expansions of Ananta, Seish uh, uh, in relation to gravity and time. These are all um, under the umbrella of, of Nityananda Balaram. 
So, and that's that's the feature of him that we're seeing in these rare verses. The world, he, he expand, expands the world above and he expands the world below. So here we're looking more into the world below, but as above, so below, is, as it is said. Um, so just briefly from, to, to, to describe how, how Nityananda goes from the spiritual world to the Mahavishnu, uh, the, the, the world of Goloka, of course, is very intimate where Krishna and Balaram are comrades, um, brothers or friends, and um, he expands uh, the Dom there. And then his, his first expansion is for the opulent and majestic, more majestic Leelas of Mathura and Dwarka. So in Mathura and Dwarka, that's Sankarshan. Um, he expands as that. Balaram is just in, in Vrindavan. So in the metropolis of, uh, of Mathura and the, the mega metropolis of Dwarka, they take on the forms, Krishna and Balaram, they take on the forms of, uh, of Vasudev and Sankarshan. Mula Sankarshan is the particular name for Balaram when he's in um, uh, Mathura, and, sorry, Mathura and Dwarka. So and they, they go there and along with their son and grandson. Um, uh, Pradyumna and Aniruddha. So um, then moving from kind of the intimate majestic realms of, of Mathura or Dwarka, um, they move to the purely majestic realms of Vaikuntha. Um, and again, the group is manifested as, uh, as Vasudev Narayan and as Maha Sankarshan, where Narayan is engaged in his Leelas, um, his Vaikuntha Leelas, he's, he's interacting with all the liberated beings. Um, the liberated stole, uh, souls who have these these um, you know these these amazing kind of uh, positions of of liberation salokya sarupya samipya um, like that they live in the abode of God they're in, in his entourage they have the same form as of, of him as him except you know etc. So what happens is that God being very very kind and loving he wants to share these statuses, these, these liberated statuses, um, but everyone there is liberated. So Sankarshan, knowing you know, the mind of his friend, being his best friend, he knows his mind very well, uh, the, 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 the desires of his friend and master. So he gives birth to the Shristi Lila, the Lila of creation and uh, being the shelters of the Jiva Shakti, he uh, expands the whole world and the whole show of creation begins and uh, Gumaraj beautifully stated in his commentary that he who is transcendent um, now becomes imminent. So again, this is this nice, very kind of like um, holistic idea, or I don't know if that's the right word in Gaudiya Vaishnavism where God's, he's, he's purely transcendent, but he's purely imminent at the same time. It's never just one or the other. It's like this beautiful, um, you know, beautiful balance. So in this verse, we're hearing about the very beginning before cause and effect. Like I mentioned the name Karana in this, uh, in this name, in this, in this verse, first to Mahavishnu as the cause. So he's the first cause, the cause of all causes. Um, there's, there's no one, you know, no one beyond him. And the first cause doesn't have to have a cause either. Uh, so the jurisdiction of Mahavishnu's concern is the world of cause and effect, even though he's outside of it. And this is, of course, the world of karma. Um, but as is stated in the verse, he's distanced. He's distant from it. He remains in his transcendental position. So he's he's more of a witness in this sense. Um, it's his glance. So he's witnessing, and it's his the, his glance that sets off this chain reaction, so to speak. He doesn't enter into it. Uh, in the same way that the, the next two Purusha avatars does, but he does in the sense that he glances at it and sends the jivas who are just like small sparks, small reflections uh, of himself, um, little sparks of consciousness, him being the reservoir of consciousness, and then they set the world in motion. And uh, the word here is, uh, it, a word here used is atma maya. So by his own internal energy, this is accomplished. That was, yeah. By his own internal energy, this is accomplished. And this word atma maya, his own inner power. Um, what what we're seeing here with the the use of this word is that we're seeing a distinction made between his own nature, his own internal nature, 
um, and his, his the primary Shakti and the energies of his secondary Shaktis uh, or, or intermediate Shaktis like uh, Prakriti, the material creation, the Jivas and whatnot. So this Atma Maya is what allows God to appear in the world or uh, contact the world, but not be of it. And we find this in the Gita, explained in the Gita, um, where Krishna is describing his appearance as an avatar. I'll just read the verse. Ajopi san abhya yatma bhutam ishvaro pisan prakritim sva adishyaya sambhavami atma mayaya. Although I myself am birthless and by nature, nature imperishable, i.e. beyond the world of cause and effect. And although I am the controller of all beings, nevertheless, remaining in control of my material energy, I manifest by my own inner power. So th this is where he's speaking about avatar tattva, where he enters the word, world. But this word atma maya is used. And this is how um, the Lord enters the world, but is not of the world or does not become touched by the world. Um, and this is also the energy that is used, um, or this is also the energy that allows the great devotees also to move and function in the world and not, not be of the world. So we, we see great devotees, you know, they very much look like in, they're in the world, functioning in the world, but actually um, they're under the, the shelter, the umbrella of the same energy. And it's, it's referred to later in the Gita, Mahatmanas Tumam Partha Daivin Prakritam Ashrita. So this divin prakritim sin atma maya, those great devotees who are sheltered in this nature, this this allows them to function in the world and not be of it in the same way as as the Lord. So this is the Adi avatar we're talking about here, the the original avatar through whom all the other avatars come. So he's like in a sense the, <clears throat> well he's the he's the um, the avatar in which all the Leela avatars pass through to come into the material world. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but um, it's through him that all the avatars uh, appear uh, as is described. And sometimes he's described as having uh, thousands of heads, thousands of hands, thousands of uh, crowns and jewels, um, uh, because the idea is that these innumerable avatars pass through him. We, we find in the third, a little bit further in the third chapter, um, that there, the number of avatars is asankhya, so it's they're uncountable. So sometimes this, this Mahavishnu is described in that way. There's a nice verse actually just in the, in the beginning of the third chapter where it goes and um, describes this. Pashyantiya do rupam adrava chaksha. I'll just read the English. I won't torment you with my. Uh, Sanskrit, but the devotees with their perfect eyes see the transcendental form of the Purusha who has thousands of legs, thousands of thighs, arms and faces, all extraordinary. In that body, there are thousands of heads, ears, eyes and noses. They're decorated with thousands of helmets and earrings and are adorned with garlands. So sometimes this Mahavishnu is described in this way, um, uh, emphasizing the point that, that all the avatars pass through him. So he glances at the material nature and his glance gives light to the world so it's this is like the you know in the beginning was the word or this is the the the, the hindu creation myth um he glances at the world and he gives light to the world his glance like i said is made up of the jivas and their sparks of lights of light of consciousness and self-awareness like he is so there's a mixing of this light and darkness the the darkness of matter and the light of consciousness and this kind of starts the whole show the whole material show which is uh, uh, like a shadow. Well, it's an interplay between light and shadow. I was thinking like these shadow puppet shows, you know, um, there's a movie called Sita Sings the Blues and there's, they, they, I think in Bali or somewhere, maybe in India, there's these, uh, they, they use these shadow puppets. So that's what the material world is like the shadow puppet theater. There's some connection with something else, but it's this mixing of, of dark <clears throat> inert matter and light conscious beings. So, so this is similar to the idea of the multiverse that we find in, in uh, modern science. I'm not very familiar with it, but certainly here we have the multiverse, the infinite multiverse. Um, there's some correlation there. And um, so these in, in, uh, infinite verse, uh, universes are manifesting from his body and then taking another form, he enters into them as Garbhodakshayi Vishnu. So that's the next verse here. 
And this is where we see that biological life begins. So I'll read the verse, verse 31. Taya vila shi taya vila shikeshu guneshu gunavaniva ata pravishta abhyati vigyanena vrijam vitaha. So after creating the material substance, the Lord expands himself and enters into it. And although he is within the material modes of nature and appears to be one of the created beings, he is always fully enlightened in his transcendental position. So here we're seeing Garbhodakshaya Vishnu. And as Garbhodakshaya Vishnu, he, like the verse says, he enters into each universe, um, finding only darkness uh, in these universes with no place to reside. He begins to consider um, what to do. This is how this, the, the story goes. And I guess he was really worried about it or he, he was considering a lot because he ended up filling up half the universal egg uh, with the, uh, the water of his, of his perspiration. Um, so in the water of his perspiration, he made a bed and lied down, an antisesh and lied down. And from his navel grew the lotus stem, which would become the birthplace and the home of, of Lord Brahma, who's the um, uh, patron saint, I guess the patron saint of uh, engineers. He's the engineer of the universe who, who does the, the combination and, uh, and uh, assembly of, of all the um, elements. Of, so, um, and among this stem, this lotus, the stem of the, the, the lotus that comes from his navel, the, the 14 planetary systems are found. So in Sanskrit, the word garba in Garbhodaksha Vishnu, garba can mean womb. And we have all that, all those elements, uh, you know, uh, poetic, uh, symbolically or poetically found um, in this part of the story. We have the waters, like the amniotic fluid, um, so we have the waters of the universe, um, and we have the 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 lotus stem, almost you know coming from his navel, almost re resembling an umbilical cord, um, and not to mention the fact that the universes themselves are um, consistently described as egg shaped. So there's this kind of like um, real kind of birth um, creation in, in in ways that we can kind of uh, relate to, even though the story seems fantastical. There's these elements here, and and the 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 elements of the womb that we're we're kind of familiar with, and um, the the um, prominence of water here also is is making the point that water means life, especially for biological life. Where there's water, uh, there's life. That's why with all these uh, all this space exploration with NASA, NASA exploring other planets and stuff. Well, the, the main thing in the news is like, is it, was there signs of water? Was there water on the planet? Was there water on Mars? Was there ice on the, the moon? Because, you know, from what we've understood, at least, water means life. Um, this is where we see the appearance of Lord Brahma and the creation of the planets that support biological life. So he said to be the, um, Lord Brahma is said to be the initial kind of collective of all the jivas before they, they they uh, take on their individual individual bodies. Um, and like all people do at some point, Lord Brahma is the kind of the par, uh, you know, the, well, what's the word, the para, anyhow, it's kind of a representation of all the jivas. We see him asking the question, why? You know, he's searching out his sources, just as we do, just as all jivas do. We see this is one of Brahma's first acts. He's, he asks the existential questions that that humans ask, hopefully, <laughs> that humans ask, and, and that uh, the sage is asked in the beginning um, of the in the beginning of the Bhagavatam. He asks this question, "Why?" and search out his his origins. You know, this is something that most thoughtful people do. This is certainly probably why we're we're all involved here. Um, and he found himself surrounded by by darkness. So in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, um, it makes the comment that the Virat Rupa, which is a, the universal form of the Lord, or is conceived is conceived as an expansion of this this form of the Lord. Um, so it's an expansion of Garbhodakshaya Vishnu when we think of this Virat Rupa, and that's because um, Garbhodakshaya Vishnu is the Lord who enters into each of the universes and activates it. So in a sense, he's kind of like the soul of the body of the universe, the Virat Rupa. Um, so we see this kind of uh, dichotomy 
although the universe is him in the sense that it's a transformation of his energy, um, it's also like his body and and um, the soul of it, the the activating life giving principle of it is this Garbhodaksha, Garbhodaksha Vishnu. So he's the one who expands himself as this um, universal form that sometimes we conceive of. So we have the material planets resting within the umbilical cord or the the uh, the lotus stem coming out of Garbhodaksha Vishnu. Um, there's 14 planetary systems, and within these 14 planetary systems, there are seven oceans. This was I found this to be really interesting. When I first read the Krishna book, it struck me very much. There was this description of the ocean of salt water, the ocean of milk, the ocean of yogurt, of ghee, of sugar cane, of liquor, and of sweet water. So when I read this in the Krishna book for the first time, you know, when I was first encountering Krishna consciousness, I thought like, wow, what a what a amazing description what a magical fantastical world you know it was like I, I wanted to experience that plus like how detailed it was like who could have come who would have come up with who could have come up with such ideas and and then i you know i found that more and more in Gaudiya Vaishnava, i was just like who could have come up with this who could have come up with this it's really like almost uh, you know nobody could have been so creative imagine in their imagination and whatnot to to, to come up with these things so it, you know, in a sense, you think, well, maybe they must be real. They're like beyond, uh, beyond something that even the most creative human could come up with. And it's here where we find the famous ocean of milk. So we're we're going to go into the to the third Purusha avatar, um, and this is where we find him. Uh, in a sense, the Vishnu who's closest to us, Kshira Dakshai Vishnu, Kshira meaning uh, milk. Um, so this is the, the avatar Vishnu who's closest to us. And we find him within the planetary systems, lying on an ocean of milk. Um, and it is, he, is the, he is the one who is considered to be the Paramatma or the super soul of all living beings. So I'll, I'll read verse uh, 32 and 33, which uh, describe him. Yatahi ava hito vahnir, darushva eka svayonishu, naneva bati vishvatma, buteshu cha tatapumam. So the Lord is the super soul, pervades all things, just as fire pervades wood. And so he appears to be of many varieties, though he is absolute without a second. Aso guna mayer baver buta sukshmendriyat manadmabhi sva nirmiteshu nirvisto bumte buteshu tad guna. The super soul enters into the bodies of created beings who are influenced by the modes of nature and causes them to enjoy the effects of these by the subtle mind. So from the giant, uh, from the giant uh, Mahavishnu uh, and the multiverse to the Vishnu that resides um, in every egg-like universe, Garbhodakshaya Vishnu, um, we now get to the Vishnu that resides in every atom. Um, and even smaller, that, smaller than that, he, he resides with every jiva. So the jiva is described as infinitesimal, one quadrillionth, the tip of a of a um, a hair on your head, very very small. So this is the Vishnu that is is in every atom, and he's with every every jiva. He's very small, so he pervades all things. The word, the meaning of the word Vishnu really comes out here. He he's everywhere. Um, so this is the idea that God is closer to us than we can even imagine. Um, sometimes even, you know, sometimes the most valuable things actually are the smallest things. When we were a kid, you know, at Christmas, it was like the biggest present was the one that caused the most excitement. Um, but it could turn out that it wouldn't, it was not always the case, you know, it could have been a wheelbarrow or something like that. Um, so, you know, sometimes very, very valuable things come in small packages. And that's something, you know, that can be learned from this idea of the Paramatma. Um, you know, like a diamond ring, for example, it's very valuable. I mean, it's very precious, it means a lot, but it comes in a very, very small, you know, an engagement ring, like it comes in a very small, small box. So small can be big in terms of, uh, you know, small can be valuable. Um, sometimes even the greatest people don't, you know, can't remember this or don't uh, realize this. And in a sense, that's why um, the demigods you know, they have to always go to the shore of this ocean of milk to petition Vishnu. Um, they're, they're described as being unable to see him. Lord Brahma 
um, a certain manifestation of Lord Shiva or um, uh, Mother Bhumi, um, they're unable to reach, actually reach uh, Svetadvip. They stand on the edge of the ocean and make their petitions from him, uh, make their petitions to him from the edge of the ocean. And of course, the milk ocean represents affection. Milk is a representation of affection. We know we know that because we, um, you know, we, we care for cows in this in this sangha. So it means the only way to reach him, the only way to to, to reach Svetadvip is is really through affection. We see this, like for example, in the birth of in the birth of Krishna, we see this milk ocean, and the demigods approached the shore of the milk ocean, but they were they remained at a distance, kind of offering prayers. Um, they were not able, it's described in, in the text, that they were not able to see Mahavishnu directly. Um, you know, but this form of uh, Vishnu is very close to them. Um, it's more close to us than, than our own life, really. Uh, the, the, you know, it's there with the jiva. Um, so again, this, you know, these distances are, are kind of measured in affection. Um, Kshirodakshai Vishnu, I mean, this whole idea of milk, you know, you can play it out. I'm sure you understand, but Kshirodakshai Vishnu, for example, you know, he's, he's also uh, described to be the maintainer. He's the maintainer of the universe, just as children are maintained by their mother's milk or all mammals, their children, excuse me, are maintained by, by their mother's milk. So while petition, uh, petitioning Kshirodakshai Vishnu, Lord Brahma went into trance to receive the reply. He, it was done uh, through telecommunication. It wasn't face-to-face. Uh, -face. And Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur comments that, um, that you know, Brahma didn't see or meet Vishnu. And, and that, that from, from this, we can understand that to see Vishnu is very difficult, even for, for Lord Brahma or Lord Shiva. Um, so when Krishna appears in the world as Krishna back back then, or as uh, even more, you know, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the more recent past, um, being the, you know, he's the origin of these things, just, and, and, and ordinary people are seeing him. Um, you can see how, what a display of extraordinary mercy it is. So this is something about the three avatars, um, the three Purusha avatars. There's a nice verse that's quoted in the Chaitanya Charitamrita uh, from that section describing the glories of Nityananda Balaram. Um, it's from the Sattvata Tantra, and it's quoted by Rupa Goswami in the Lagu Bhagavad Tamrita. So I'll just, I'll spare you this, my Sanskrit recitation and just read the English, but it's a nice verse. Vishnu has three forms called Purushas. The first, Maha Vishnu, is the creator of the total material energy, Maha. The second is Garbha Dakshai, who is situated within each universe. And the third is Kshira Dakshai, who lives in the heart of every living being. He who knows these three becomes liberated from the clutches of Maya. So it's worth studying who these, these are as the result can be liberation from the clutches of Maya. So now we come to the final verse of the chapter. Text 34. Bhavayati esha satvena lokan bhai loka bhavana lilavatara nurato deva tirya naradishu Thus, the Lord of the universe maintains all planets inhabited by demigods, men, and lower animals. And in his play, he assumes the role as, of incarnations to reclaim those <clears throat> in the mode, <clears throat> excuse me, in the mode of pure goodness. So the idea here is that we're moving from the description of the leelas of creation to the leelas of leela, <laughs> the leela avatars, the leelas of past, uh, the pastime avatars where the Lord uh, enters into the world and performs his pastimes, either to to do a specific function um, or to just to, to display himself. And the play of the Lord, um, you know, where he enters the world, there's a purpose to it. Besides these kind of specific empowered um, delegations, when we see something, someone like Krishna um, displaying his pastimes in the world, the, the point of it is is um, to reclaim the devotees. So how does he do this? He does it by by displaying his charming leelas and his charming uh, pastimes, his attractive pastimes. And so by displaying these pastimes and his personality, as the verse says, um, there we go. as the verse says, he to he, the incarnations are to reclaim those in the mode of pure goodness in Sudha Sattva. So what it means is that the pastimes where he enters into the world and and performs these these events these attractive pastimes 
is to attract us to him, to see his personality um, and become attracted to it. And ultimately, uh, concomitant with that would be to be attracted to our constitutional position. Um, where we, where, you know, when we hear how attractive the Krishna, the all attractive is, um, we become attracted to our position as his servant, because this is kind of the conundrum of the material world. Um, that that constitutionally we're not able to be what we want to be, which is enjoyers. Um, uh, it's it's uh, just a recipe for frustration. So so the idea of these um, these leelas and and you you find throughout the Bhagavatam just thinking about the leelas, just reciting the leelas, just remembering the leelas have this like amazing effect. And what it is is because it attracts us to his personality and it attracts us and shifts us to the desire um, to, to want to be in the position of his servant. Um, so this is answering, this verse is answering the third question of the sages. They, they asked, um, the third question was, uh, why did Krishna appear in the world? Basically, why did he take birth from the womb of Devaki? And more generally, why did he appear in the world? And the reason why he appeared in the world is to attract us by his pastimes and attract us to wanting to be his his servant. So it's worth noting um, in this verse uh, that as we, you know, we heard about Kshiradakshai Vishnu being residing in the hearts of all living beings and not just humans. And that this is a nice, a nice point where Hinduism kind of is a little bit more uh, excels or is a little bit more straightforward with these kinds of ideas is that we hear that, um, you know, he he's in the heart of all living beings, not just humans. We hear that uh, he maintains, in this verse here, he maintains all the planets, the planets of the demigods, men, and animals. And he also enters into them as various Leela avatars in the forms of humans and animals and devatas. So um, this, is, this is very nice. We see that the divine is not just in the human heart, but also in the heart of the animals and even in the heart of plants. Um, so this is a nice, a nice, a nice thing to remember about Hinduism. Um, so he blesses all forms of life, not just human life. Even though human life is the most conducive to, to um, spiritual practice, the Lord is, you know, he's very kind and loving, and he he blesses all species, all forms of life, with his presence by entering into the species as one of them. Um, there's unlimited, unlimited uh, uh, avatars. There's avatars, ever, you know, in all in all forms of life, and we have examples of this in the Bhagavatam, which I just love. You know, you have examples like Matsya, that it's like the holy fish, or you know, this this incarnation of God as a fish. This is like bizarre to 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 some people. Or Kurma, you know, you have a transcendental turtle who's you know, who's who's a, a primary. Um, avatar of God. And, you know, even, even the pigs are blessed with the Lord's presence in their species. The Lord Varaha, generally pigs are, you know, people don't, don't associate pigs with divinity, but you just see, even as Varaha, he enters into the pig species and, and blesses them with his presence. So it's such a broad and um, accommodating vision of God and holiness and, and, and blessings. And, and of course, the pinnacle of this is found in human society, with the human-like Krishna or the human, even more in a sense, human-like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, you know, and sometimes in this context, people say, oh, you're just anthropomorphizing God. You know, you're taking the human form and you're just projecting it onto God. Um, you're anthropomorphizing him. Um, or I suppose, you know, if you see like an, an animal form of God, they would, or, so the Egyptians, for example, would put like an animal head on a human form, but whatever. Or, or if we look at one of the animal um, Leela avatars of the Lord. They say, oh, you're just zoomorphizing God. You're, God. you're just, you know, applying the, the uh, form of an animal onto God. But it can, it can be looked at another way. And, and um, you know, we tend to look at things in a descending way instead of an ascending way. So we're not necessarily projecting things onto God, but perhaps this world is a projection from God. So... It could be more that we are deomorphic instead of anthropomorphic. God is anthropomorphic. We are deomorphic. So it means, you know, we are formed in the image of God. And you, you hear this idea in Christianity too, uh, made in the image of God. But what's so nice about um, 
Hinduism and especially, you know, this, this chapter, this chapter coming up describing all these in, incarnations is that um, the image of God is found in humans and also uh, in all the other species as well. Um, not only just in their heart, but but as a, as a, a, you know, a Leela avatar, they come. So uh, it's very nice that we see humans are made in the image of God. Turtles are made in the image of God. Fish are made in the image of God. Uncivilized men are made in the image of God. Civilized men are made in the image of God like that. So it's it's very nice. So we're all participating in, uh, in some way in God's essence. Um, and that's kind of what I what I drew out of this last verse by when it listed the, the three stages. So I guess I'll stop there. Um, like I said, the next, I have one more class to do um, and I finished the chapter. So I'm just gonna kind of, it, the, 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 the third chapter actually repeats these three um, Guna avatars, just in a sense to describe how the Leela avatars enter the world. So here we saw these, the, these three Vishnus in, their, in relation to their creation of the universe. And then um, they're repeated again at the beginning of the third chapter, just to be as a very clear description of how the Leela avatars enter the universe, because they enter, excuse me, through Karna Dakshari Vishnu. Um, and then it goes on to this one, this list of all the Lord's avatars in this world. Um, Krishna and Balaram are in that list, and then you become unsure, are they are they Leela avatars? Or I thought they, that Krishna was the supreme personality of Godhead, but in the list, he's just, you know, after Ram, but before Buddha, and you know, but then the, the, it goes on and it gets to the real core of what makes, you know, the Krishna consciousness uh, philosophy that that no Krishna is Svayam Bhagavan. So like that. So I'll stop there. I'll just. Uh, I think you guys are able to unmute yourselves. Um, if anybody has anything that they would like to. Uh, share or any comments or corrections or any questions um we can we can take some questions or or if you want to ask them on the top of the too um we can do that Haribol. <laughs> um a very good natural way to clean them oh yeah uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> you can put you can use a, a spoon of coconut oil <laughs> mm -hmm. and half spoon of teaspoons and half teaspoons of baking soda uh-huh and then uh, you make a kind of paste mm-hmm you massage it on your nose wait three minutes and then you wash it away okay and it shrinks the pores mm -hmm. right yeah you will have a new because uh -huh. <laughs> my nose is clean it's just it looks like a universe could come out of the pore <laughs> okay thank you very much <laughs> i will try that Does anybody else have any comments or questions or corrections or thoughts? Hey, Gorsunder. <clears throat> Haribo. Hello. Mi Mitra. Um, <clears throat> that was the first, first time I heard that, that, um, well, we're made in the image of God. Okay, that's the Bible thing, but you're, uh, you, you, stretch it out and say turtles are made in the image of God and pigs are made in the image of God and fish and how oh, that was pretty cool. Did you come up with that one or is that something you heard from somewhere else? I'm not, I mean, I, I, I'm not smart enough really to come up with things myself, but I just kind of absorb things. Um, and you know, they, they just kind of like resurface sometimes when I'm reading it, when I'm reading or, or meditating on it. Now, you know, I, I don't want to take credit for that because uh, probably I heard it somewhere at some point, but um, you know, I, I can't really say, I mean, it's just kind of what I, what I was thinking of it because I've always had, like personally, I've also always had trouble kind of with this idea of anthropomorphizing God. So I've kind of thought about it a lot. And I got a lot of help from Bhaktivinoda Thakur in that sense, um, because he talks a lot about this kind of like um, 
instead of ascending kind of symbolism, he talks about descending symbolism. Um, and that's something that I've gone to whenever I start having kind of doubts about, you know, the forms of being very Indian or very this or that, you know, um, I tend to like, go and reread some of the things that Bhaktivinoda Thakur says because he, he he really cleared that doubt for me. Um, so it's kind of just the same idea, the idea that, um, you know, the, the, you know, that every, you know, God is everything and, and he's beyond everything, but he is everything and everything participates in the being of God in some sense. So instead of us thinking oh well you know the turtle the just projecting the image onto god why not think well no that's an aspect of god that we that we see reflected in this world and i just thought yeah i just thought it was kind of a nice way to think about the natural world um i don't know you just see that in hinduism so much the more i look at hinduism the more i see it's just you know it's just this really nice synthesis of ideas um but i can't direct you um Besides like uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's writings about um, uh, the holy name and the the, uh, the form of the deity and these types of things and how he describes them, um, I can't direct you to anything particular about um, that. The only thing I, that comes to mind is I know Gurumaraj comments that, well, I think it was in Krishna Samhita Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks about um, how the Leela avatars parallel the evolution of the species, you know, from water to amphibian, to land animal, to uncivilized man, like that. I think Bhaktivin, but that's not exactly what you're asking about. So I don't know. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna run with it. Oh, I'll good. pass it along. Okay, thank you. And I'll just say, I heard it from somebody in Costa Rica. That sounds good. There's lots of life here. I mean, I just saw a little a little lizard walk across my table. There's all kinds of all kinds of forms forms of life here, and certainly they all participate in God in some way. Anybody else have anything they'd like to share? Okay, well, it was nice speaking with all of you. Um, and I'll see you for one final class next week where we'll kind of take a fun uh, stroll through all the different avatars. It's, it's fun to talk about all their stories and all their leelas. And that's the point to become attracted to the, their stories. <laughs> so, Shimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Haribo.